Hello, my name is Robert Suddy, and today I would like to talk with you about the background and impact of the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act on life, economy, and politics in contemporary Syria. In 2014, a Syrian regime defector by the alias of Caesar sought refuge in the United States and brought with him pictures of the atrocities being committed by the current leaders of Syria. This collection of photos, known as the Caesar Report, prompted the United States government to enact the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act. I am conducting a comprehensive analysis on the Caesar Act and its effectiveness at prompting political change in Syria, ending the Syrian conflict, and improving Syria's well-being. I'll begin by discussing some of the precursors to the revolution. Although there were many contributing factors to the Syrian revolution, there are four main ones I would like to highlight. The first one is regional instability, which can be attributed to the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring was a series of revolutions that began in 2010, which sought to overthrow tyrannical leaders and corrupt governments throughout the Middle East. The next factor was Syria's failing economy, which can be traced to two sources. The first was an expansive drought which plagued Syria in the 2000s and took a large toll on the Syrian economy. As rural farmers' fields dried up and they were forced to move to urban areas to seek out work, Agriculture, which once constituted 25% of the Syrian GDP, dropped to 17%. A couple years later, in 2009, the global economic downturn further affected the Syrian economy, decreasing foreign direct investments by 28%. The next factor responsible for influencing the start of the revolution was Syria's current president Bashar al-Assad, who inherited presidency in 2000. Soon after coming into office, Assad started the Damascus Spring, which was a loosening of media and speech regulations meant to bolster his public image. It opened the door for democracy advocates to start talking about the possibility of political system reforms in Syria. Unfortunately, the regime's elites disagreed with Assad's choice to deregulate Syria, and about as soon as the Damascus Spring began, it ended and political repression was once again established. Upon assuming the presidency, Assad promised many solutions to these current issues within Syria, including socioeconomic improvements, political opening, and job creation, although to this day, no significant reforms have been made. The final major catalyst to the uprising was the Muqabarat. The Muqabarat is Syria's expansive security bureau, which accounts for one-third of the Syrian military budget. Under Assad, they operate with relative autonomy and frequently use fear and excessive force to deter potentially disruptive activities. These ingredients work in conjunction to produce an unemployment rate between 20 and 25% in 2009, and in 2010, 30% of Syrians were below the poverty line. As conditions continued to deteriorate, discontent began to spread within the population. These growing tensions manifested themselves in the Syrian conflict. The Dara uprising was the beginning of the Syrian conflict. Here are a couple pictures of the peaceful protests and the government's violent crackdown, which was responsible for killing hundreds of civilians. As the civil war ensued, three main sides developed, the revolutionary forces, the government forces, and the Islamic extremist groups. The revolutionary army consisted of the Free Syria Army, the National Salvation Front, and the local coordination committees, while the government forces were the Muqabarat, the Syrian Army's elite 4th Armored Division, and the Syrian Electronic Army. The regime was also assisted by the military forces from Russia and Iran. Hoping to capitalize off of the instability in Syria, Islamic extremist groups such as the Nusra Front, Hezbollah, Hamas, and ISIS decided to get involved in the conflict. Before I continue, I would just like to make note that extremist groups do not represent the majority of the followers of Islam, and they do not share the same beliefs as those who practice normal Islam. Now, I would like to focus on the unique role that ISIS had in the Syrian conflict. Assad freed many former members of the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda, who came together to form ISIS. He supported them in coordinated attacks on civilians in order to legitimize his crackdown on terror platform. As you can see, Assad is willing to go to almost any lengths to solidify his authority. In fact, he commonly twists the truth to favor his regime. In Bashar's first speech after the protests began, he stated that the protests were a facilitation of domestic conspiracy that wishes to create instability within Syria. 
On June 6, 2011, 120 security personnel were killed by what Assad claimed were armed gangs, but actually they were killed because they threatened to defect to the opposition. Also, with help from ISIS, he was able to justify his indiscriminate bombings of cities for the purpose of protecting Syria from terrorist organizations. Although Assad's arsenal was filled with more than just deception, he was not afraid to commit crimes against humanity. The Caesar Report detailed systematic killings of protesters, bystanders, as well as extensive arbitrary arrests, disappearances, torture, denial of medical assistance, executions, and mass graves, among other violations. Besides those atrocities, he ordered the bombings of many public and private facilities such as schools, businesses, religious institutions, and hospitals. To top it all off, it was discovered that his regime was employing the use of internationally banned chemical weapons, such as saline gas, which contains neurotoxins that kill through excruciating asphyxiation in as little as one minute. Here are a couple pictures of the destruction that Assad has brought to his own country. The picture on the left is a hospital complex, and the one on the right is a residential street. Now I will be showing you some of the graphic pictures included in the Caesar Report that depict dead human beings. If you are squeamish, please avert your gaze. These two pictures show emaciated and deformed corpses from inside a political internment camp. The dead people in these images were likely mere citizens protesting their corrupt government before they were forcefully taken to these camps and killed. This set of pictures details the evidence that the regime is engaging in abhorrent acts that include strangulation, emaciation, ulceration, and other forms of torture. As violence spreads across Syria, citizens are forced to seek refuge elsewhere. Recent estimates conclude that there are 2.7 million refugees outside of Syria and 2.1 million inside Syria. Here's a picture of the Zatari refugee camp, which is home to 76,800 refugees. As you can see, the conditions in these camps are extremely cramped, and they are not equipped to deal with the natural disasters that they face, such as flooding. In an attempt to improve the situation in Syria, the United States decided to enact the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act in December 2019. The Caesar Act establishes direct and secondary sanctions against the Assad family and anyone who tries to do business with them. This picture shows the members of the Assad family. These sanctions freeze the regime's assets and restrict new investments, exports, or supplies of service by any American entity. These sanctions were designed to specifically target the following industries, oil, natural gas, aircraft manufacturing, construction, and engineering. Knowing that it would have adverse effects on the Syrian populations, the United States included a complicated set of humanitarian waivers within the sanctions for those who wish to offer Syria aid without becoming targets of the sanctions. The Caesar sanctions were initiated in an attempt to accomplish distinct goals. The first being the financial constriction of the Assad regime. One assumption was that if the Assad regime was to lose its funding, it would become unable to support itself and collapse. The next goal is to discourage the international support in the form of economic and infrastructural reconstruction efforts, which might give the Assad family a chance to ingrain themselves further into the Syrian government. The third and most prominent goal of the Caesar Act is to prompt the overthrow of Assad by either the Syrian elites or the Syrian citizens. If this can be achieved, then the fourth goal of political opening can occur and a democratic process can be founded in Syria. To do this, the sanctions plan to disrupt the Syrian economy by discouraging normalized relations with Syria and de-incentivizing foreign reconstruction efforts. Section 401 of the Caesar Act specifies the only way in which the sanctions can be lifted. To lift the sanctions, Assad must put an end to aircraft bombings of civilians, allow foreign humanitarian organizations access to Syria, release all political prisoners, end the bombings of public and private facilities, ensure safe, voluntary, and dignified return of refugees, and those who committed war crimes must be held accountable.
the Caesar sanctions have had a mixture of positive and negative results in Syria. The sanctions are successfully placing Assad in a financial constriction. Him and his accomplices are desperate for money and doing everything they can to acquire more resources, including attempting to liquefy assets in countries such as Lebanon. Bashar also became suspicious of his cousin Rami Makhlouf and began seizing his plentiful assets. Makhlouf, known as the financial arm of the Assad regime, at one point owned up to 60% of the Syrian economy. This included large shares in all of the industries depicted to the right. Additionally, any Syrian business that was profiting off the civil war was subject to large back tax increases in a feeble attempt to replenish the government's lost funds. Although it is tricky, it is also possible that the Syrian regime has tried to circumvent the Caesar sanctions through use of well-connected elites and local brokers who could do business with northern Syria, which is excluded from the sanctions. As much as the sanctions have affected Assad, they have had a disproportionate effect on the Syrian people. Daily demand for oil and gas considerably outweighs the available supplies. Inflation has plummeted the value of the Syrian pound. The pre-war value of the Syrian pound was 50 per one US dollar, and in March 2021, it was valued at 4,700 per one US dollar. The average income in Syria is reported to be $27 per month, which has resulted in dire poverty rates. A minimum of 80% of Syria lives in poverty. Due to this lack of money, there has been an increase in organized crime which is because people are forced to find illegal methods of income to support their families. As a result of this economic disaster, protests have become increasingly common even in regime-controlled areas. If the sanctions continue and humanitarian aid does not increase, it is likely that the Syrian population will face an imminent famine. The picture on the top shows a line for gas, and the one on the bottom shows a line for household gas. The extent of poverty can be seen in these images. The one on the left is a line for bread, and the one on the left is a picture of citizens digging through landfills to find anything edible. Despite the horrors that the Assad regime has committed, their main ally Russia continues to support them. Russia's strategy in involving itself in the Syrian conflict is to bolster its reputation and establish investments in the Middle East not to help the Syrian people. Russia helped Assad fight the revolutionary forces and reclaim its lost areas, but are they committed to staying? Russia has been known to drop allies for not catering to their wishes, and Bashar has been flirting with that line for years. As of now, the two parties are still allies. Although, if Russia decides that Assad is not worth investing any more time or money into, the Syrian regime will likely not be able to withstand another series of assaults from the opposition. Is there an end in sight? The answer to that question is complicated because the United States is reluctant to lift the sanctions because it will allow Assad the ability to reconstruct and the time to collect the willpower to continue. The Caesar sanctions have had questionable success in Syria and they seem to be doing more harm than good to the general populace than to the regime. To effectively prioritize Syrian civilians, the U.S. faces the decision of either lifting or modifying the sanctions to facilitate the recovery of the Syrian economy and society, along with the repercussions that may come with that, which include the continuation of the Assad regime, or continuing the sanctions but increasing mitigation efforts for the Syrian public, such as streamlining the humanitarian waiver process and contributing more assistance to the refugees in Lebanon. I predict that the Assad regime will hold on to their power in Syria until the bitter end or until it loses the support of Russia. If the sanctions continue, it is unquestionable that the Syrian public will suffer. Although, if the sanctions are lifted, the regime will continue its tyrannical subjugation of its citizens' free will. Throughout the rest of my research, I hope to come to a conclusion as to which of these options will produce the best result for the Syrian people. Thank you.